Go and have a seat. Jesus. Jesus. J E S U S. Jesus. Uh, isn't that why we're here? Jesus. I mean, it, it's just a name in some sense. It, it, it's five letters, J-E-S-U-S. But the amazing thing is, if it weren't for that name, there's no reason for us to be here. There's no reason for me to be standing up here. There's no reason for us to be talking about worshiping God, uh, understanding who we are, as we just sang. There's no reason to sing Hosanna in the highest. There's, there's no point without Jesus. And when Jesus comes into your life, when Jesus steps into our stories, it, it, it's amazing because that's something that makes our story worth proclaiming, worth sharing. You know, we've been talking about, you know, that, that you, you know that this whole series about you got to see this. You know, it, it's something that's worth sharing. You've got to see what this is all about. And, and you know what? That word this could be replaced. You got to see Jesus. Because it's Jesus. That's all we're talking about. What makes our story worth telling? It's Jesus. What makes our story real and truthful and honest? It's Jesus. What makes our story all that our story is supposed to be in this world, in this life that we have? It's Jesus. Jesus. There, there's, there's nothing more we can say. There's nothing more that needs to be said. In some ways, I could just stand here for 30 minutes and say, Jesus. I won't. <laughs> but even the apostles understood this fact. If you look in 1 John chapter 1, um, John is explaining why they proclaim, why they talk about, why they share, why they tell people, you got to see this. And this is what he says in verses 3 and 4 in John chap 1 John chapter 1. He says, we proclaim to you, we share with you, we tell you, we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. You know, this is, this is our experience. This is what, what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. You know, that idea of fellowship with us, he's trying to say so that you can share the same knowledge and understanding that we have. That you can understand that along with us. And he says, now this is what our fellowship, this is what our understanding is. He said, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, we're writing these things to you so that you may fully share our joy. If we have any joy, if we have any truth, if we have any understanding of our story, it comes in Jesus. It's like this. I, I could almost picture John, the apostle that traveled with Jesus, that saw him, that, that lived with him, that ministered with him, that saw him on the cross, that helped put him in the grave, that saw him when he rose again. I can hear John saying here this morning, he, he's the Freedom Ridge Church. It's real. It's true. The story of Jesus. Everything you've heard, I can tell you it's true. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I've touched him. It is real. It's something to get excited about. But here's the thing. Jesus is the main point of the story we've got to share. Jesus is the main point of the story we've got to share. But it's not always what we expect it to be. That story isn't of, it may be all about Jesus, but it may not be all about Jesus in the way we expect and I want to look at Palm Sunday for just a second. 
We talk about Palm Sunday. We, we, Christy talked about Palm Sunday. I mentioned Palm Sunday. Some of you that grew up in church, um, you understand Palm Sunday is that Sunday that people come out with palm branches and wave them around in the air, and we sing songs like, Hosanna in the highest, right? That's Palm Sunday, right? I asked somebody this week, I said, what's Palm Sunday represent? And you know what they said to me? And this is somebody that grew up in the church. You know what they said to me? I don't know. What does it represent? You know, they could tell me what happens on Palm Sunday. They can tell me where Palm Sunday came from, but they can't tell me what it actually represents. So I thought maybe for a foundation, we would talk a little bit about what does Palm Sunday represent. You know, Palm Sunday, yes, it's about the, the, we get the idea from palm branches. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem for Passover and they laid palm branches down in front of him as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, that doesn't sound all that glamorous or something to celebrate, but we need to understand that Jesus had gained quite a bit in popularity as he had been a rabbi, a teacher, and a miracle worker in all of Judea. And here he was, walking into Jerusalem for the Passover, He had a really big following by this point. People had heard about him. They had seen him in some cases perform some amazing miracles. And, you know, people were like, you know, they wanted to be around Jesus. They wanted to hear from Jesus. They knew that it was all about Jesus. But they had made another step forward in their understanding of Jesus by this point. Because the Jewish people for centuries had been desiring, had been yearning, had been praying to God for a savior, for a king that God had promised them, a king in the line of David, King David, that God had promised to his people to rescue them and to save them. And in their minds, that meant that it was a king that was going to sit earthly on the throne in Jerusalem while they were being oppressed by the Romans They were being oppressed by the religious elites in the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and the the Jewish people believed that this king from God, sent by God, was going to rescue them and set them free. And it's somebody that they had been hoping for and yearning for for centuries. And here he was, Jesus, doing miracles and and teaching things that were, none of them have ever heard or seen before. And they're thinking, could he be the one? Could he be the, the, the Messiah, the true king that's going to rescue us from all of these things? Could Jesus be the one? And so they believe that they're ushering in a king. In fact, the, this, this, the, him riding a donkey may not sound that glamorous to us, But he was fulfilling a prophecy that said that that the king would ride into town on a donkey. The fact that he was riding into town on donkey was fulfilling the prophecy that he was the anointed, the appointed, the awaiting king, and them singing Hosanna, which basically just means praise, praise to the highest, praise to God, and they're, they're ushering him in as though he is a king. Jesus went into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as the king. That's what all of them believed. Unfortunately, they had their own idea of what that meant. They had their own perspective in their mind of what Jesus as king was going to be. And that perspective, you know, was that they felt oppressed, earthly oppression You know, they were taxed by the Romans. They didn't have freedom of, complete freedom of their religion because of the Roman uh, rulers. You know, they they were held back by the law that was held over their heads by the Jewish elite. They they, they did not feel this, this sense of freedom and hope, but God had a plan. And his plan was different than the plan that they had. They had a plan that Jesus was going to step into Jerusalem. He was going to establish his kingdom. The people were going to rise up, and he was going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem and rescue them from all of their cares and woes. So he had a big fan following. 
And, and we know what kind of sealed the deal for him is just before he entered Jerusalem, he was in Bethany, which is just outside Jerusalem, and a friend of his had passed away. And with a large group of people around, he asked them to roll the stone away, and he said, Lazarus, step out. And after days in the grave, his friend Lazarus stepped out. Word got around. This man controls life and death. Surely he is the king we've been waiting for. So here he is. You know, in in our sense, uh, you know, I know I have some really diehard Browns fans in the room, right? So if you'll play along with me for a second. Browns fans share a lot of similarities with the Jews. You've been waiting a long time for that champion to walk in. You understand me? You with me? You feeling me? All right? You, you, you've been waiting for that championship team to strut down the street to the ticker tape parade, you know, shouting accolades of, we won, yeah! I don't know if that makes Steelers fans Pharisees or not, but we'll, go with, we'll just stick with the Browns fans right now. So, but... but it's that kind, of, that, that kind of anticipation, that kind of joy that they, they've, they've been waiting and waiting for this, and here's Jesus, and this is the way it was going to happen. But unfortunately, the same people, probably in some cases, that were screaming, Hosanna in the highest on Palm Sunday, were crying, crucify him at the end of the week. Because... It didn't look like he was doing what they expected him to do. He didn't meet their expectations. And one of the hard things for us, you know, I mean, we know the rest of the story. We know what happened next. We know, but, but here's the thing. What if you didn't? What if you didn't know the whole story? Would you have been there on Palm Sunday? Laying palm branches at Jesus' feet? No one that laid a palm, I truly believe that no one that laid palm branches or cloaks in front of Jesus on Palm Sunday thought he was going to be dead on Friday. I don't think any of them would have predicted or thought that. That wasn't what any of them wanted. That wasn't what they thought they needed. It wasn't true. In their mind, they wanted an earthly king to reign in the seat of David. But here's the thing. Palm Sunday wasn't the championship. Palm Sunday was pregame. It was getting ready for what was coming. And we know the end score. I want to look, uh, if you want to look with me, we're going to be in Matthew 28 because we're going to do something somewhat probably from, from church circles. I shouldn't be talking about this today. You know, it, it, I may be breaking some kind of law somewhere in the church because I'm going to talk about something today that I'm not supposed to talk about on Palm Sunday. You know what I'm going to talk about on Palm Sunday? The resurrection. I'm supposed to save that for next week. The big reveal, right? It's, it's, the, it's the, you know, Jesus is risen. Thank you. We'll work on that for next week. Wow. <laughs> but here, you know, I want us to talk about this because there, there's a difference. There's a, you know, when we talk about that our story is all about Jesus, that it's all about J-E-S-U-S, it's all about Jesus, I want us to understand that our story being about Jesus can mean different things. Just like those on Palm Sunday could have worshipped a Jesus that was different than the Jesus of Matthew 28. Because this is Jesus in Matthew 28. Early on Sunday morning, as the day was, as the new day was dawning, I love that expression. You know, it was just, it was just a signification of the sun rising, but it was also a signification of the sun was rising. As the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb, the tomb that they had laid Jesus in just days before. Suddenly, it says, there was a great earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. 
His face shone like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell in a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid. It's a good, that's a good start, by the way. When an angel comes from heaven and looks like lightning, don't be afraid. It's a good start. <laughs> he says, I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. You're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said he would do. Come, see where his body lay. Come, see for yourself. Touch the place. Touch the garments that he was wearing. They're right there. See for yourself. And now, go quickly and tell the, his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he's going ahead of them into Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women quickly ran from the tomb. Um, and they were frightened, but also they were filled with joy. And as they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. Now here, they, they have a chance encounter, an amazing chance encounter. They weren't expecting, they saw an angel, and the angel had said Jesus was risen. They weren't, they weren't leaving there expecting that they were going to bump into somebody on the way back, but they did. And it says in verse 9, as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. That's an amazing thing. He wasn't an aberration. They actually touched him. They grabbed his feet and touched him. That, that is an amazing difference in what you see going on here. It, it wasn't an illusion or a figment of their imagination. They touched him. Then Jesus said to them, again, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Sometimes we miss that Jesus is the hero of our story. Sometimes we miss that Jesus is the hero of our story. Now, if I would ask you, especially those of us that grew up in church and have been doing this church thing for a while, if I asked, who's the hero of your story, you would say, Jesus, right? I mean, I don't think that, that that's an uncommon thing. That, you know, but here's the thing is, on Palm Sunday, you know what the hero of the story was? Jesus. But it wasn't the same hero that came. It wasn't truly who he was, but it was who they wanted him to be. This is what the angel said. He said, I know you're looking for Jesus. Is that what he said? You know, sometimes we've got to remember that we have to lead the complete statement. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. I know you're looking for a dead Jesus. I know you're looking for the earthly Jesus. I know you're looking for the tangible Jesus. I know you're looking for the Jesus that everybody on Palm Sunday wanted to put on the throne in Jerusalem. I know you're looking for that Jesus. Guess what? That Jesus ain't here. You know what Jesus is here? The one who's risen from the dead. Hosanna and I. That's the Jesus. That's the, you know, there's this whole picture of, of the tale of two Jesuses. You know, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the classic story, the tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times, right? It's just this dichotomy that, that is this both things. It, it's almost like that for these, these, these two Marys that were, that were at the tomb. It's the worst of times, right? Jesus, who they loved and cherished, and was, he's dead. It's the best of times. He's risen from the dead. Which Jesus are you going to worship? Which great Jesus are you looking for? Are you looking for the earthly liberator that's going to free you from the oppression uh, that you feel upon you on this earth? It's going to take away all of your relational and financial woes and everything. Are you looking for that Jesus? Or are you looking for the Jesus that conquered sin and death once and for all? Who are you looking for? There's a story told in... Uh, Jesus' ministry about a woman that was brought to Jesus. And she was brought before Jesus because the, the religious leaders were wanting to trap Jesus. Because this is, the, this is the picture of what's happening here. The 
the uh, authority of the Romans over the Jews meant that there were certain things that the Jews could not do. And one of those things is they could not pronounce a death sentence upon somebody. They couldn't put somebody to death. But the Jewish law at that time said if somebody was guilty of adultery, that they should be stoned to death. So here's Jesus, who's gained popularity, that has been been considered a wise teacher. And the Jewish leaders bring this woman caught in red-handed in adultery before Jesus. And basically condemns her. And they say, she is guilty, and our law says that she should die. But the thing is, if Jesus agreed with them, if Jesus said, yes, the law says she should die, that's the penalty she, could, she should have, and even if he didn't throw a stone, but everybody else in that mob threw stones and killed her, then Jesus would be guilty under Roman law, and then the Romans could take care of this Jesus problem that the Pharisees had. Jesus knew this, but Jesus wasn't here to condemn anyway. Jesus didn't come to earth to condemn. And so the story goes that that this mob came around all with stones, throw the woman down. Yeah, she deserves death, Jesus. You've got to condemn her because that's what the law says and, and you need to do it. And then Jesus just quietly bends down and starts writing in the sand, it says. There's a lot of hypothesis about what he wrote, but nobody really knows for sure what he wrote there. I think, me personally, I think what he did is he actually bent down and started writing in the sand so that the mob calmed down. That the, their attention and focus was off of the stones that they wanted to throw at this woman. And they're like, what's he writing? I, I don't... And so they begin, the mob begins to calm. And then Jesus just simply says, whoever among you is sinned the least, whoever has not done any wrong, you, go ahead, throw the first stone. Get it kicked off. And it says, one by one, each of those people around that mob dropped their stone and walked away till none were left. And Jesus asked the woman, is there no one here to condemn you? She says, no one. He says, I don't condemn you either. He says, go and sin no more. It's a beautiful picture That's not the Jesus that most people would have expected. That's not the Jesus that most people were thinking. Jesus, you know, he he disobeyed the law, the law that came down from centuries, the law that said that this is the way our life and world was supposed to be. This is what I had made up in my mind that Jesus was supposed to be. And that's not the Jesus that's here because the Jesus that Jesus should have said, yes, kill her. But the Jesus that she found was the one that touched her deepest brokenness, that touched her deepest sin, that touched her where she needed it most, and and each and every one of us needs that Jesus too. And in that moment, in that that beautiful moment where he says to her, then I don't condemn you either, Jesus just became the hero of her story. The story of the rest of her life, the story of her her eternity, could not be told any longer without the name Jesus. So what? So what? Um, I had uh, <clears throat> had some friends of mine this week became grandparents for the first time. And uh, they, they knew it was coming. It wasn't a surprise. You know, usually you get like nine months to prepare. <laughs> Uh, the baby did come like a week early, but, but they, they were prepared. They were giving presents to, you know, and they, they were already prepared to, to how they were going to spoil this new little baby that was coming into their life. And, and so they, they were kind of giddy grandparents, and, and, um, and the baby came. And I saw them the next morning after the baby came. And you, you know, what, know what they did? They started pulling their phones out and showing me the pictures. You know, your phone pictures are dangerous because like when you used to have the wallet pictures and you could kind of pull the whole thing out and you had all the pictures hanging from your wallet, there was a limit to them. With the phone, it could be a hundred pictures of the baby. Oh, this is the baby. This is so-and-so holding the baby. Now this is the baby smiling. This is the baby's toes. This is, 
You know what I'm saying? The phone is a dangerous thing. So, I mean, here they are. They're showing me the pictures of the baby, and they're telling me the story. And they're giving me the statistics about how big the baby was. The mom and, 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 and dad were fine, and the baby was good, and everybody's all excited, and all of this. You, you understand where I'm going with this, right? Would it be a story without the baby? Take the baby out of it. What would it be about? be empty. It'd be, I mean, it would be like, uh, how was your day? It was all right. How was your day? All right. Conversation over. Glad we shared. Let's do this again tomorrow. But because there was the baby, the baby was all that it was about. The baby was the hero of the story because without the baby, there was no story. Jesus Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no story. You know, in the Bible, uh, there's, there's four, you know, I mean, the whole book, really, if you, this, this whole, uh, all the text from, genera- from generations, <laughs> from Genesis to Revelation <laughs> is all about Jesus. It really is. You know, in some places it's more obvious than others. But if you talk about Jesus' earthly life, it's not described any better or any more than in the four Gospels, we call them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Those four pieces of the New Testament tell the story of Jesus. Now, I want to challenge you for a second. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and take Jesus out of it. Would you have a story? Would it be something that has lasted 2,000 years and passed on from generation to generation? Is there anything worthwhile in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John if you take Jesus out of it? Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the central part of the story. But I, I, I want to challenge us in something because, you know, one of the things we've been talking about this whole series is you got to see this. You know, that so many people met Jesus and they said, you got to see this. I need you to see this. I need you to understand this. And, and, and they'd invite them to come and see what they experienced or who they experienced with Jesus. I believe there's actually five Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you. And here's the thing. A lot of people in your life will never read the other four. But they will you. They will see your story. They will see you live it out. They'll see you share it. They'll see the life-changing power of Jesus in your life. And the question is this. Is Jesus the hero of your story? Is Jesus really the hero of your story? And if he is, do do you understand who Jesus really is? Do you understand the Palm Sunday Jesus or the Easter Sunday Jesus? Because there's really a big difference and it's not just seven days. Jesus should be the hero of our stories and, and if he is, then you need to share your Jesus story. It's worth sharing. It's worth sharing your Jesus story. That's why I've been challenging us uh, to invite three people. Invite, you know, three families. Think about it. Pray about it. There are three people in your life I know that you could sit there and say, you know what? I think God wants me to share my story with, mm, 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 mm. You insert the, mm. And invite them because Easter is a beautiful time to, I think, invite people. And this is why I think so is a lot of times we look at sharing our story that it's hard to start. No, where, where, do, you, where do you start? Or how do you, how do you get into a conversation with somebody about Jesus? Well, here's the thing is, you don't have to start the conversation. I believe God already started the conversation. In most people's lives, and even if you look at your own life, God already started the conversation. It's called Easter. You know, even if people don't know anything else, they know that Easter is about Jesus. They may add the Easter bunny and chocolate-covered eggs to the whole story, but, but they know that the story of Easter and the reason we have Easter is about Jesus. He started the conversation 
All we have to do is just say, hey, you know what? Jesus has made a difference in my life and in my story. I would love for you to hear what that's about. Well, join me on Easter. I'll save you a seat. I'd love for you to come with us. But I guess we all have to ask this question. What are we looking for from Jesus? Are you looking for the Palm Sunday Jesus that, uh, that's going to take care of your earthly needs right now and right here? Or are you looking for the Jesus that conquered sin and death for eternity? Now, I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't take care of us here and doesn't, doesn't meet our needs in some amazing ways, but I'm saying that Jesus is more than that. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he entered as king. And you know what? That is not when he became king. Jesus didn't become king when he died on the cross. Jesus didn't become king when he rose from the dead. Do you know when Jesus became king? He was always king. From the very beginning, because it says in the Bible that Jesus was in the beginning. He was with God. From the very beginning, the very start, the very first words in the story, before there was nothing, there was God, there was Jesus, and he was already the king. The issue isn't when he became king, it's when he became your king. And what does that mean? That's what Easter's about. That's what we celebrate. That's what we're inviting people to celebrate. But here's the thing. Without Jesus, there is nothing to celebrate. This whole idea of which Jesus, you know, Palm Sunday Jesus, Easter Jesus, I'm going to whet your appetite. The, that's what we're going to talk about next week. Because we're going to talk about where's the road to freedom is. And the road to freedom is found on the other side of an empty tomb. And that's what you're inviting people to come see and to come hear and to come experience is that truth, that knowledge of Jesus. Because I believe there is more joy in heaven and on earth in somebody finding a relationship with Jesus than anything else in all the world. It says the angels rejoice. And I believe that people's story can change when we invite people to come and see what we've experienced. Father God, I thank you that you give us the story. I thank you that you invite us into, really, it's your story. I mean, we, we often are so self-absorbed and, 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 and focused on us, Father God, that we just think that, that you're coming into our story, that we're inviting you to come into our story. But really, Lord, what, what, we're, what we're doing is, is, is you've invited us to enter your story. And when we enter your story, you take our sins and all of our wrongdoing and, and you pay the penalty for those things so that we can have life with you. That we can understand truth and we can have a foundation and a purpose that goes beyond just ourselves and this limited time on earth. You didn't want to just reign on earth for us, but you wanted to reign in heaven for all eternity. And we thank you and we praise you. We praise you for Jesus. Now, I, I know that as, as I'm sharing this, Father God, that there are people here that know that truth and they understand that truth. And maybe we, 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 don't, we don't live that truth all the time, but I ask that you will help us do that and that you will be putting people in our hearts and minds that, that we should be inviting to come and see who you really are. But I also know maybe there is somebody here today that would honestly admit, I, I've known all about Jesus, but I don't know that I, I've known him in that way. I don't think I've invited him into my life so that I can be part of his story. But I don't want anybody to leave here today without knowing that they can, they can have that knowledge and that truth and that reality. So it's just nobody looking around. This isn't for anybody except for between you and Jesus. But if there's anybody here today 
that just feels like maybe I, I don't have that story. I don't have that truth, but I want that. I want to know Jesus in that way, that, that he is not just my king of earth, but he is my king in heaven for eternity. And I want to walk with him. And if you don't, if you don't feel like you've had that, but you'd like to, you'd like to invite him to do that today. If you'll just look up to me, I just want to pray for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, praise you. Praise God. Anybody else? You know, if you're one of those that looked up to me, I just want to want to tell you that it's really, it's not complicated to ask Jesus into your life, but, but it, it's not necessarily easy either because we have to let go of all the stuff we've had behind, behind us. But I just want to ask you, Father, that you will be with them and give them the strength and the courage to step in this. And if, and if, that's, if, if that's your desire, if that's your prayer to want to invite Jesus into your life, I just want you to just kind of repeat this prayer after me. And I'm going to ask all of us here, nobody prays alone. So even if you've made that decision, you've prayed that prayer before, let's everybody pray this prayer again, reconfirming this. But those that want to do it for the first time, celebrate with them. But, but just pray this prayer. Father God, I'm sorry for the things that I've done. I'm sorry for I, how I have disobeyed you and your word. I turn from that and I invite Jesus into my life. Help me walk in that truth from here on out. Amen and amen. And let's celebrate because this is what we celebrate on Palm Sunday. This is what we celebrate on Easter because angels in heaven rejoice when somebody has entered the kingdom of God because of the name of Jesus. Because people have today have a new story because of the name of Jesus. If you made that decision, I, I just want to challenge you and encourage you to, to, to let us know, to talk to somebody and, and find out what, what you can do to continue to walk in that journey. And more importantly, maybe the greatest first step is invite three people to join you next Sunday <laughs> to be a part of it. But let's all just stand together and close in worship this morning.